So today let's take a look at this faulty switching power supply from a Peltier fridge. Let's explore how does it work and if it's fixable. And this one seems to be nicely built. The mains comes in here, there is a fuse, an NTC thermistor for inrush current limitation, some interference filtration, double inductor, a capacitor, another double inductor, the bridge rectifier made of discrete diodes, and the primary smoothing electrolytic capacitor. On this heatsink there is the switching transistor, probably a MOSFET, the main switching transformer, some interference, class Y1 capacitors here, some small auxiliary capacitor, or capacitor in the snubber network more likely, and the snubber network diode, the resistor is probably SMD in it, and some current sensing resistor here, here's the optocoupler, and besides the main power supply it also seems to have some auxiliary power supply, or standby power supply which might be still running when the main one is off. This one is using this transformer, again some class Y1 capacitors between the primary and secondary side. The main power supply has the rectification diode on this heatsink and some output electrolytic capacitors. There are some indication LEDs. And the auxiliary power supply has this rectification diode, this output capacitor, some power resistors, some small regulator and some connectors here. And the other side now of course, with some SMD components. This big group of SMD resistors is the resistor in the snubber network. Here's the control chip of the main power supply. And the switching transistor of the auxiliary power supply is integrated in this chip. So this package is basically the control chip and the switching transistor in one for the auxiliary power supply. And let's go back to the component side. Let's start with a visual inspection and without any measurements you can already see some problems in it. The first one is this capacitor bulging on the secondary side of the main power supply. The other one, the same type, actually isn't. This one at least, maybe high ESR or low capacitance or open circuit. But very often capacitors of the same type fail together, the electrolytic ones. Another problem you can tell visually is this blown apart resistor here. That's the current sensing resistor of the main power supply. The main power supply is a flyback, where the current sensing resistor is typically connected between the emitter or source, in case of a MOSFET, of the main switching transistor, and the negative of this capacitor. When you see this resistor exploded, it typically indicates that this transistor is shorted. This low resistance current sensing resistor basically was connected to the rectified mains voltage, which for Europe with 230 volts is about 325 volts as DC, or the mains voltage times the square root of 2. And when the transistor shorts, this voltage is connected to the resistor just via the primary of this transformer, which is an extremely low resistance for DC. And that's why the resistor is exploded. Nice. There is no way this resistor is still working. So now it's obvious we have to replace at least this capacitor, this transistor and this resistor. Now a closer look at the other side of the board. Here are the pins of the main transformer. This one and this one are the primary. This one and this one are the auxiliary winding. One pin of the auxiliary is connected to the rectified mains negative and the other pin of it goes via a resistor, low resistance resistor and a diode into the chip. The auxiliary is basically rectified and produces a low voltage on the primary side to power this control chip. The primary has one pin connected to the positive of the rectified mains and the other pin goes to the drain of the transistor, or a collector if it was a bipolar transistor. These resistors are probably also part of the snubber network. The source of the MOSFET the power transistor is connected via the current sensing resistor to the negative of the rectified mains and these pins are the exploded resistor. The gate of this transistor is connected via some resistors and some diode to the output of the chip. And the source of the transistor which goes to the current sensing resistor also goes via a small resistor into this chip for current sensing purposes. This is probably the current sensing input of it. Here's the typical 10 kilo ohm resistor between the gate and the source of the transistor. And now an even closer look at the components near the chip. This is the resistor connecting the gate of the transistor to the output of the chip end. You can see a spot on it. It seems this resistor was blown apart. And here's the current sensing input resistor, which connects the current sensing input to this current sensing resistor basically. This resistor basically also works as a low pass filter together with a small capacitor between the current sensing input and the negative of this chip. And here's this negative of the chip is connected to the negative of the rectified mains. And this trace continues under the chip here. Here's the negative of the small electrolytic capacitor. Here is the auxiliary power supply powering this main chip and the startup resistor is here. Because it also has a standby mode, the auxiliary power supply can power the main power supply chip. 
or I should call it the big power supply and the small power supply to prevent confusion because each of the transformers has an auxiliary winding. This one on these pins and this one on these pins. But let's go back to this disaster with the resistors near the chip. Given the resistor going from the gate to the chip is blown apart and also the resistor going from the source to the chip is blown apart, it's quite likely the chip was also damaged. Can I even read any marking on it? Of course there is a locker on the board and on all the components, so it's tricky to read it. This marking on the small SMD components is very often very difficult to read even without the locker. Is it going to be any more readable after removing the locker from it and putting a white heat sink paste on it? This time everything's obvious just from looking at it, but let's do some measurements anyway. The main switching transistor, drain to source. I never expected anything else. Looking at the current sensing resistor, drain to gate, gate to source. Everything's shorted here. All three pins of the transistor are shorted. The current sensing resistor, which is about 0.3 something ohms. That's blown open a circuit, of course. Now let's measure the supply pins of the chip. Of course let's measure on this small capacitor. That's a convenient spot to measure. But it goes to the supply pins of the chip. It's difficult to probe because there is the locker on the board. A very low resistance, basically a short on the supply pins of the chip. So the chip is destroyed. Which was of course already 99% likely after looking at these resistors. The current sensing input in reference to the negative of the chip. Way too low voltage drop. The gate output. This looks like a typical silicon voltage, doesn't it? It might actually be some diode in the circuit. But given the supply pins are shorted, the chip is gone. I don't think it's the capacitors on the supply rail of the chip. Let's disorder the chip because it's extremely unlikely for the short to be somewhere else. And let's probe the supply rail of the chip again. The capacitor charges and no short anymore. It was the chip, which is no surprise to me. Is the secondary diode also shorted? It's a three pin diode, a double diode with a common cathode, but both the diodes used in parallel as just one diode. This is the forward voltage drop. It's not shorted, it's a good shot key. And the other way it should be open. Well the capacitors are charging and the diode is good. I don't think there is any other problem on the secondary side other than this capacitor. And on the primary side the transistor, this power resistor in the current sensing path. About two or three SMD resistors and one diode, maybe. And of course the chip. It definitely should be fixable if I can find a replacement for it. Of course we should also check the fuse. Which surprisingly is actually not open circuit. And the NTC thermistor about 5 ohms seems to be also good. Of course you should also test the bridge rectifier diode. It's good, good. Good, good. And this might also be a good opportunity to show how to test optocouplers. We can probably get to it on the other side better. I can use my simple DIY transistor tester using just the positive and a negative probe, not the base or gate probe. The positive goes to the collector, the negative to the emitter. And the LED is lighting up when I probe my multimeter diode test into the diode of the optocoupler, the infrared LED in it basically. I can see the 1 volt voltage drop of the infrared LED in the optocoupler. Of course infrared LEDs have much lower voltage drops. And the phototransistor in the optocoupler is turning on, indicated by my transistor tester. I can also use these two devices the other way. The transistor tester goes into the LED of the optocoupler, putting about 4 milliamps into it and lighting it up. When the phototransistor in the optocoupler is illuminated, its voltage drop is quite low, 0.15 volts in this case. And if I don't supply any current into the infrared LED, the transistor in the optocoupler, the phototransistor is off. Two multimeters, both set to a diode test. Connecting the phototransistor first, that one's on the primary side, and it's open with no current in the LED. And connecting the other multimeter to the LED. On the right multimeter you can see the voltage drop of the LED. On the left one, the voltage drop of the transistor, which is on. But because the diode test supplies less current than my transistor tester, the transistor was dropping about 2 volts when it was on. And the multimeter is the other way. Now the one on the left is on the infrared LED. And this one actually doesn't indicate anything. Well, it seems the diode test might not supply enough current. Well, the transistor tester can. Just out of curiosity, the clamp meter diode test only puts about 0.9 milliamps into the optocoupler infrared LED. My transistor tester was giving it over 3 milliamps. And this one of our diode test is using 1.1 milliamps. Given the diode tester current for all multimeters is about the same, roughly 1 milliamp, 
the optocoupler testing technique with two diode testers only works if the gain of the optocoupler is more than one, which does not necessarily have to be the case. So this trick is not guaranteed to work, the transistor tester is better for this, or some even a simpler circuit like this, with the battery some indication LED and a resistor calculated, so it supplies several milliamps. The snapper diode is good, and the snapper capacitor isn't shorted, I can see the parallel resistors to it, I was checking this and this. Some diode here, might be a shot key, some diode here, good. Checking the impedance or ESR of the output capacitors, they're in parallel, so I'm basically checking both, and it's 41 bloody ohms. So both of these capacitors are completely gone. This demonstrates that if the capacitor is not bulging, it doesn't mean it's good. The impedance of these capacitors should be about 0.1 ohms or less. High capacitance capacitors should have a low ESR. And the primary capacitor is about 400 milliohms. It's a lower capacitance, so it's still kind of acceptable. And this one is using 1 kilohertz, this one is using 100 kilohertz, so it reads a bit lower. This capacitor is still going to work. And the tiny electrolytic capacitor parallel to the supply pins of the chip, 1.6 ohms, which is acceptable for a small capacitor like this, 10 micro. Checking some tiny ceramic capacitors for a short is here, not shorted, not shorted, just for case they got damaged by a much higher voltage here. And the 470 micro capacitor in the standby power supply, just 60 milliohms. I'm not even showing how it is these, all four capacitors in the standby power supply are good. Almost all components in this power supply are tested, there's a lot of them faulty because of a cascading failure. I guess these capacitors failed first, a very high ESR. Without this capacitance the secondary voltage will overshoot, but this also makes the primary voltage overshoot. This might have destroyed this transistor, it's shorted, which then destroys the current sensing resistor, plus three SMD resistors and a diode. And of course the chip which I already removed. And in a lot of cases this actually destroys also the bridge rectifier diodes, the NTC thermistor or the fuse. I guess the reason this fuse is not blown is because the current sensing resistor went open a circuit first. And for completeness I can even ring test the primary of the transformer using my DIY ring tester, which shows a lot of rings so the transformer shouldn't have short turns in it. This ring tester can test in a circuit, it's using just 100 millivolts for the test, so diodes and transistors are not yet conducting, not skewing the test. Of course in this case this transistor is shorted, which would basically dampen the ringing and show zero rings probably, but because the resistor in series with it is open circuit, the shorted transistor does not affect the ring test. And also the other components going from the transistor to the negative rail are open circuit. Now this power supply is tested, as thoroughly as I can imagine testing it, and the conclusion is, if I can find the replacement for this chip, it would work. This time it seems difficult to find what the chip actually is, based on its SMD marking code. These are sometimes confusing, some of the digits at the end can be a date code or a factory code or country code, only some of them might actually refer to the type. And here is a partially reverse engineered schematic, and here you can see the pinout of the chip, the negative pin, the positive supply pin, which is connected to some parallel capacitors, some startup resistors, the auxiliary winding, but also to the auxiliary of the standby power supply for some reason. Here's the feedback pin, which is connected to the optocoupler. This pin is not used. This is the current sensing input pin, with this current sensing input resistor, some filter capacitor here and the current sensing resistor in the transistor source, the source to gate resistor, and this gate output going to the gate via this resistor, and this resistor with the diode, so the gate actually discharges faster than it charges. Here's this number. This resistor and this resistor is made of actually more resistors. I'm not drawing the secondary side of the feedback, but it probably uses the 431 voltage reference to control the LED in the optocoupler. And in this circuit these capacitors are bad, the transistor is bad, this resistor, this resistor, and these three components here. And of course the chip. Based on the pinouts the chip could be this. The schematic looks similar, but it says the marking should start with D6, not 3.3. It could also be this. The schematic also is similar, the pinout is the same, but the marking starts with 25. Or maybe this. The pinout matches, this pin is unused, but the DSMD marking seems to begin with BB. And these chips might be kind of interchangeable, but the operating frequency can differ, the maximum duty cycle can differ, the supply voltage and the under voltage lockout thresholds can differ for the chip, the feedback pin sensitivity can differ, and the voltage threshold for the current sensing pin can differ, so it's a bit tricky to replace it with a chip which has just the same purpose and the same pinout. 
Well, I put even more effort into its identification. And the chip seems to be this, which took me quite some time to figure out, because it's not in any SMD marking or top code database. I tried at least 20, here's the simplified schematic, the pinout seems to match, and the marking 3 3 year week week. This took quite a lot of searching and going through a lot of data sheets. This thing seems to be on AliExpress from several sellers. For as low as $1.86 for 10 pieces and about $2 shipping. Of course the shipping will take about a month. The chips might be fake, but I might give it a try. The chips are ordered. When they arrive, if they ever arrive, the power supply might be fixed in the next episode. This turns into another bloody long video, which was also bloody laborious to make, but I hope the diagnostic techniques I demonstrated could be useful. And if you like my videos, please consider subscribing, supporting my channel on Patreon or using the thanks button, if anybody made it that far. And big thanks to all of you who already support me. You keep this other channel alive.